For many of us, these special times of the year, these uh, special and unique services that we hold like Christmas Eve and like tonight on Good Friday, these, these services hold a special place in our hearts, don't they? We look forward to them. We look forward to the, the solemnity and the, the drama. We look forward to hearing once again the familiar and glorious words of Jesus. The repetition and the familiarity bring us comfort. They bring us a sense of belonging. They bring us a sense of longing for the future when everything wrong will be made right. But in the midst of these familiar times, it's all too easy to miss some of the details. We focus on the grand themes, on the the large strokes of the picture of the story of redemption. And so at times like these, it's also important not only to revisit those beautiful, familiar stories, but also to slow down, to focus on some of those details, to find some of those less obvious threads that contribute in those beautiful ways to the tapestry that is woven by the grand weaver. That last passage that Mark just read mentions one of those details. Luke 23, verse 45, tells us that the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Have you ever stopped to think about that? Have you ever thought about the significance of this detail, that the, the significance of this seemingly small little thing that goes by so quickly as we read through God's word? All three of what are called the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all record this detail. But there's another small detail that Luke does not record for us. It's a detail that we find in Matthew's gospel and also in Mark's. Mark records it for us in the 15th chapter of his gospel, beginning in verse 33. He writes this, When the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, behold, he is calling Elijah. And someone ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink, saying, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. And Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed his last And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Did you catch it? Did you catch it? Verse 38, it goes by so fast. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So why does that matter? What are the gospel writers and God through their pens telling us by including these seemingly small little details? Well, that curtain or the veil in the temple was what separated the people from that, the, 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 the central place in the temple complex. It was the focal point of all their worship. It was the inner sanctum. It was called the Holy of Holies. This was the place where God would meet with his people. This was the place where the glory of his holiness and his presence were manifested among his people. During Israel's wandering in the wilderness, in the days of the tabernacle, this holy of holies contained the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, the golden vessel that contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments and the manna from wandering in the wilderness and the staff of Aaron that blossomed. In Jesus' day, though, the ark had long since been lost, and so the Holy of Holies contained the altar, and that altar was where the high priest, who was the only person who could enter the Holy of Holies, and even then, he could only do it once a year on the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, and even then, it was only after sacrificing a bull and a ram and undergoing specific rituals of cleansing and purification and adorning himself in specifically prescribed pure white robes, on that day of atonement, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies and make a sacrifice on behalf of the sins of the entire nation of Israel. And this Holy of Holies was separated from the rest of the temple by a huge, massive curtain or veil. It was probably about 30 feet high and about four inches thick. There was no getting through it by accident. There was no chance of it being blown aside by a breeze. 
And so when the high priest performed this duty, he was literally entering into the presence of God himself, passing through the veil, passing through the curtain that separated God's holy presence from sinful men and women. The curtain, you see, was there for the protection of the people. God, the creator, is holy. We, the creatures, are sinful, not holy. Sin cannot stand in the presence of God. God's pure holiness cannot tolerate the presence of sin. Do you remember back in the book of Exodus, Moses asked to see God's glory, and what did God tell him? He said, Moses, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And yet God, in his mercy, allowed Moses to see just the tiniest sliver, the back, as it were, of his glory. And then when Moses came back down the mountain of Sinai, back into the camp of the people of Israel, his face was then shining with the reflected glory of God. And what happened? The people were afraid. Moses had to put a veil over his face. Why was that necessary? Why do we have to be separated from God's presence? Why do we have to be protected from God's unveiled glory? Well, of course, you know, the answer is sin. In the beginning, all the way back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were created without sin, weren't they? They walked with God in the joy of paradise. They enjoyed an unveiled relationship with their creator. But then, of course, they believed the devil's lies. They they rebelled against God, and so their relationship was broken. They became afraid. They hid themselves from God's presence. They tried to fashion clothes to cover their nakedness and their shame. They could no longer stand in the unveiled presence of God's glory as they once could. And so God cast them out of the garden, yes, as a punishment, but also as a mercy. Because now, for Adam and Eve to remain in the garden, in God's unveiled presence, now having sin, that would mean certain death for them. But God, in his mercy, he enacted the plan of salvation that that he determined among the members of the Trinity before the foundation of the world, and he placed a separation between us and himself that we might not immediately die but rather that we would eventually be brought to salvation. That's what Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 8, where he says that the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in the hope that the creation itself would be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. You see, separation from God, that that veil between us and our creator, that was an act of mercy on God's part. The veil, the curtain, was put there to protect us from God's holiness, to protect us from his wrath against our sin, and to remind us that we need someone else to go before God as a mediator on our behalf. That's what the high priest was. But then, Jesus, God the Son incarnate, as Jesus breathes his last there hanging upon the tree, as he calls out, to tell us die, it is finished, as he willingly surrenders his life as a sacrifice, at that very moment, that curtain, that veil, that that massive, visible, and the tangible representation of that necessary separation between God and man for our protection, it was torn in two. And not only was it torn in two, but it was torn in two from top to bottom. 30 feet high, four inches thick, torn in two from top to bottom? That could not have been the work of human hands. Only God himself could have done this. The same God who who made this separation between himself and his creation, the, the, the same God who is holy and just and righteous, the same God who would be completely and totally within his rights to destroy sinful rebels like me and like you who rebel, who rebel against his will, the same God who lowered that veil to protect his precious creatures from his holiness, he himself has now removed the separation. He didn't do it on a whim. He didn't do it because our sins were somehow now magically erased from that cosmic ledger. No, he did it because the price had been paid. The score was settled. 
The debt was covered, and the only way that it could have been done by the willing sacrifice of the only perfect man who ever lived, God the Son in human flesh. He became the curse that we deserve so that in him we might become the blessing that he alone deserves. That's what the book of Hebrews is all about. We don't have to go through a priest anymore because Jesus is our great high priest. We don't have to offer those sacrifices anymore because Jesus is our perfect sacrifice, the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Listen to the words of the writer to the Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section, in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It's called the holy place. Behind the curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the ark of the covenant, covenant on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties, but into the second, only the high priest goes. And he but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy places is not yet opened, as long as the first section is still standing, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper, but deal only with food and drink and various washings, regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation. But, but when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with human hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by the means of blood of goats and calves, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The work is done, beloved. That darkest day in human history became for us Good Friday, the best Friday. God himself did what was necessary to remove the separation between us and him. He himself removed the veil that he put in place to protect us from his holiness. He himself made a way. He made the only way to come into his presence without fear clothed not in our own good deeds or sacrifices of an animal, but clothed in the pure right robes of Jesus' righteousness given to us through his death on the cross. Jesus himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The cross was the only way. Don't miss these details, beloved. Take the time to slow down and dive into the depths of God's word. You've heard the saying, the devil's in the details? No, no, no. God is in the details. Take the time to see and savor the beauty of Jesus Christ in all his fullness, in all his glory, this glory that we may now behold without fear, without a curtain, without a veil, because of the cross. The apostle said, we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. So let us come before the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, in repentance and confession and in faith.